guys, welcome this morning to church. It's great to have you wherever you're joining us from. If you're here in the room or you're watching online or you're catching up on the podcast, hello everybody. We are in a brand new series called Making of a King. And I'm excited about this series because we're going to get to look at the life and times of one of the most influential people in the Bible, okay? He is famous for taking down a giant, but he did far, far more than that. You know his words. You probably memorized them. Maybe you just sung them. He is somebody who is so influential in the shaping of the Old Testament and so many of the stories that happen connect to him. But he's also, he's a poet, he's a warrior, he's a musician, he's a a leader, he's somebody who emerged to greatness from nowhere, and he's somebody also that gets this profound honor as being one in the Bible who's referred to as this, a man after God's own heart. Who better to look at, who more worthy of us to look at than a man after God's own heart? We know, guys, don't we, that our lives as Christians are modeled on Christ. We should be those who follow Christ in everything that we do. But there are also individuals in the Bible that we can learn a lot from. And we're going to look at King David over these next few weeks. We're going to look at some of the big moments in his life, some of the incredible moments of influence that we can learn from and we can grow in because he was a man after God's own heart. And there's not many people. In fact, I don't think there's anyone else in Scripture who has this title, this accolade to be one after God's own heart. But he's a great leader. He goes on to become a king. Spoiler, we're going to get there through the series but he, he has so much authority and power given to him. Where did he come from? Where did this guy start? You know, is he coming from wealth and honor and privilege? Is he coming from education? Is he coming from royalty? The first time we encounter this king of a nation, he's coming in from the fields where he's been watching the sheep. And so we're going to take a look at what we can learn from this man. He's a man after God's own heart. He doesn't make all the decisions that God would want him to make. And we're not going to gloss over any of the mistakes either. We're going to take a look at some of his highs and his lows. But he is one who came from nowhere and went on to rule a kingdom. And I want to know, how do we become those who can walk a trail like that and still be known as those after God's own heart? Still at the end of it all, carry this legend that goes with us that says that person, he knew God, she knew God. They modeled God to me in the rooms that I joined them in, in the conversations I had with them. How do we become those with a heart after God? So if you like a title... This is called Pastures to Palaces. I'm going to take a look at the making of a king and how we walk from obscurity into authority with God, never losing what it is that marks us out as different, what it is that marks us out as God's pastures to palaces. And this message is particularly for those of you who are in the before season of your life. You know, maybe before the calling has really come to pass, maybe before the relationship you're waiting for, the job opportunity you're believing for, before the breakthrough that you're praying for, we're going to look at David before some of the big epic moments in his life. And those moments will come. Stay tuned in this series. Next week, we're going to look at what launched him into the halls of being one of the well-known heroes of the Bible. But this week is all about the before. And I'm sure some of you in this room know how the before feels. Maybe you've experienced the before, the knowing that God has you going somewhere, but this doesn't feel like it. This doesn't feel like where God said we were going. Maybe you're waiting on something in your life right now. Maybe this season is the before. We're going to look at how we get from the before and on our way to the during and the after. But this before season, you never get to repeat it. You never get it back. This preparation season, you only get one. And we've got to make it count. So we're going to look at the before. I don't know what you're waiting for today. Maybe there's a new season ahead of you about to start. Maybe God's spoken something to you about your calling, your purpose, your shape, something that he's inviting you to step into in the future. Maybe there are desires on your heart that you know you're waiting for. Maybe this is your before the kids stage of your life or before the relationship stage or before the promotion or before the recognition. There's something for all of us that we are waiting for. And God wants to carry us to it well, and he wants us to get there right. So let's just take a look at a glimpse of this story. And I want to give you a little bit of context as to where we find David in his before. So let me just, I'm going to read that scripture in a second, but let me just give you the context, okay? It's a thousand years before Christ. 
roughly. We're looking at about a thousand years before Jesus walks the earth. And this nation of Israel, they have been ruled by judges. God has deemed fit for them to be ruled by men and women who will prophetically decide God's will because of their proximity to him. Now, some of those judges do it really well, and some of them do it very badly. You can take a look in the book of Judges. But there are, there are judges that rule the land, and there's a problem. Israel senses and feels a problem in the way that they're being governed. You see, all the nations around them have kings, and they don't have a king. And there's an insecurity. There's a comparison. There's a looking over the borders and fearing for their future. And this unrest starts to swell and stir in that nation until finally they go to their judge and they say, we want a king. We want to be like everyone else. Be careful what you wish for. We want a king to rule us. We want somebody enthroned in power because we're no longer content with the word of God coming through the men of God. We want the seat of power. We want to look to that and trust that. Guys, it's a dangerous place to be when we start to lean on comparison to look to what leads us. But that's where Israel is at. And so God says, you can have what you want. There's warning that comes with it. There's cost that will come with it. But if you want a king, I'll give you a king. And somebody is placed in the first seat of authority named Saul. King Saul comes to power. He's impressive. He's got stature. He's got background. He's got the whole resume that looks like he's ready to lead. But over the course of time, it quickly becomes clear that this is not a man after God's own heart. This is not a man who is willing to put God's will first. And so we see the, the kind of tumbling down of some of what could have been done under a godly kingdom. And Saul ultimately is passed by. God says, I can't trust you in a seat of power if you're not going to do what I'm commanding you to do. And so that's where we're picking up this story, okay? Israel demanded a king, cried out for a king, got given a king, and the king was bad. And Saul is sitting enthroned in Israel and God is moving on. So let's take a look at this in 1 Samuel 13. We're going to start here. And Samuel is reprimanding the king. He says, you've done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You've not kept the command of the Lord, the God, the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. So the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you haven't kept the Lord's command. You know, kings step into context. They step into their context. And the context that we're meeting David right at the beginning of is a context of insecurity and lack of confidence. People w wanted to trust the king and now they can't. They feel like he hasn't done right by them. They need to be won over again. And God says before he tells any of the people this, he goes and says, my, my spirit is passing on from you, Saul. You're not the man anymore for this job. We have to hold our responsibilities so well and so righteously before God because he knows other people. He might know people who might be better suited for the job in this season. And so I'm going to just take us through this morning five points for those of us in the before, those of us who are getting ready for something that God is going to do in our life. We're going to take a look at five things that we can learn from the life of David and how we can put it into action in our own lives as we prepare for where we're going from the pastures to the palaces. Because I promise you, God is taking you somewhere. Maybe you don't know where it is. Maybe you haven't heard yet what the purpose or the potential on your life could really add up to. But he is taking us forward to higher ground in him. How do we start? What do we need to know in the preparation? The first point is this. It all starts with the heart. It starts with the heart. What is the one thing that marks David out as different? Not his skill set, not his experience, not his wisdom even, not his strength. He's got a heart that God has noticed. Guys, I don't know what your background is today, whether you've grown up in church or this is your first time here. I don't know if you know all the scriptures or you wouldn't have a clue where to begin. It starts with the heart. God is looking for hearts that want to chase after him. God is looking for people who have hearts that they are readily submitting to him in order for him to get the glory and us to operate in obedience. It all starts with the heart. So who's David at this point? Nobody, literally nobody, but he's got a heart that's after God. 
I don't know what you're waiting for today. I don't know what you're waiting to fit into place in your life for you to start to share your testimony or start to build the church or start to trust God in what he wants for you. But I promise you, probably some of the criteria that you're expecting for yourself is not what God is demanding of you. All he's requiring of you is the heart that says, I believe God and I will follow where you lead me. That's where it begins. That's what marks David out. It starts with the heart. And God reiterates this in another format when we find Samuel there ready to anoint a king. Samuel's been sent to the family of Jesse and he's seeing these sons pass by. But this is what God reminds us in this moment. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab. Samuel is the prophet, the the judge going out. Uh, He's the prophet of the nation. And he saw Eliab, the eldest son, and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I've rejected him. The Lord doesn't look at these people, these things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And I want to encourage you and tell you today, guys, that here in this space, wherever you're tuning into this message, God is looking to your heart to be the guiding feature for your future. God is looking to your heart and asking you to consider what's unhealthy here, what's embittered perhaps in me, what's lost that pure faith that it once had, what's doubting, what's hurting, what's getting in the way of me saying, all you, God, and nothing else, where you lead me, I will follow. Because if we're honest, there are things that our heart can chase after that aren't God's best for us. But if we want to step into what he's calling us to, we've got to start with the heart. We've got to start with this distinguishing feature that requires only full submission, nothing else. It just requires the trust. It begins with the heart. And for David, his whole story begins with the condition of his heart. You know, he is one that we will go on to see has been put to the side. He's one that has been overlooked and discounted. He's the youngest of all of his brothers, and he's not even warranted as worthy of an invitation to this moment. When Samuel, the prophet, came to Jesse and said, bring me all your sons, Jesse decided, I'll bring you all minus one. He's the one who's still out there doing the work while they're waiting for the anointing to happen. He wasn't even involved in the moment. But look at his heart. How many of us would allow that to begin to cause some kind of irritation, some kind of festering in our hearts. It would be so natural and so understandable for us to say, I'm, I'm the least of my family. Nobody cares about me. Nobody's giving me the time. I've not been given the opportunity. I've not been recognized. I've not been invited. But here we see David, who's got one of the purest hearts in this circumstance. And that just goes to show that that's possible for us too. I don't know what your heart is hurting with today, and I do not diminish it. But I do encourage you to consider that God can take all those things and remove them from you. God can allow you to walk forward with a healed and healthy heart if you bring it to him. So we see David and it starts with the heart. But let's take a look at the second thing that we can learn from the story of David. Nobody's hidden from God. Nobody's hidden from God. And I hope that we know this in church today. But I'm sure that even some of the things we know aren't always the things that we feel day to day. David's out on the mountainside. David's out with the sheep. The youngest son of any family would traditionally be given the role of shepherd in this day. Somebody's got to do it. And so let's boot the baby out there until somebody else comes to take his place. But David's out there watching the sheep. And I'm sure in moments, feeling as though his life holds less significance than those of his older brothers, the the ones who are making decisions, the ones who are shadowing their father, the ones who are being raised for leadership. I'm sure there may have been moments where he had felt hidden. And perhaps there have been moments where you felt hidden in your life, where you felt like these days, these are the behind the scenes days. These are the days that nobody's looking at. These days are the days that I have to earn something or prove something in order to get to the position that's ahead of me. But the truth is that nobody is hidden from God. And I hope that you hear that fresh this morning, that there is not one of us that God cannot see, that God does not know deeply, that God doesn't hear when we cry out to him, when we think our thoughts, when we sing our songs alone on the mountainside. God is with us in all of that. And David's a great reminder of that, that he doesn't begin his walk with God when he reaches the palace. He begins it in the pastures. 
He begins it out there in the field where nobody sees his decisions, nobody hears his opinions. That's where he's rooting in this relationship with God. None of us is hidden. None of us in this season waiting before None of us is hidden from God. In fact, these are the seasons where we actually have a unique opportunity to draw towards him like never before. Because once the responsibilities come and once the answered prayers start getting landed in your lap and once the things start getting placed in your hands, there is a different kind of capacity that you'll enter. But right now in the before, we have a unique opportunity to press in to God. Let's take a look at these scriptures in 1 Samuel 16. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and brought him in. He was glowing with health and had fine appearance and handsome features. And the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one, the one that nobody thought it could be, the one that was overlooked by everyone else. This is the one. We're never hidden from God. In fact, in our life in Christ, Jesus invites us to be hidden in him, but never from him. We've got to remember that we're never outside of the eyes of heaven. And so those things that you're holding right now, those things that are kind of in the secret place, in the hidden place, Those are the things that God is noticing, God is watching, those things that you think don't matter at all. They're not impacting anybody else. The decisions you make in the quiet and in the secret, God is seeing them and he's noticing how you're growing in your desire for him. He's noticing how quickly you're turning to prayer now. He's noticing how you've begun to open your word more and more, how you've begun to lean into your community, how you've begun to trust him for the things that you can't do on your own. He sees those things. These preparation days, they're important days, and God is not far from you. He's right with you in them. Let's take a look at the next point that we can see from these before days in David. The Spirit qualifies us. So I'm talking a little bit about knowing that there's a call on your life, knowing that something is coming, but not quite reaching it yet. And I think sometimes our response in that is, I need to get myself ready. I need to do the training course. I need to, you know, learn the more. I need to grow in my capacity. I need to stretch the muscle. I need to do more. And that's valid. And we'll come to that in a second. But what we see happen here in David is not of him at all. It's of the Holy Spirit. Let's take a look at this. In 1 Samuel 16, verse 13, it says, Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And then Samuel moves on. He's done his bit. He's poured out the oil. He's done the anointing. The Spirit of the Lord moved powerfully on David. It's God that marks us out. Okay, if you're in a caught in a cycle right now of thinking where you're not quite ready and you're not quite qualified and you're not quite good enough yet for what you feel like God is asking you to do or the dreams that God is putting on your heart. I want to just break that right now and say you don't have to be perfect. David, through his whole life, was not perfect. And there were probably many moments where he did not feel ready at all. But it's the spirit of God that qualifies us. And so if we have got this heart to say, God, have your way in me use me for your glory, use me for what you have for me, the chances are that he is going to begin to, by the power of his spirit, equip us for everything that's ahead. And if we keep waiting to be ready in our own strength, we're going to be waiting a long time. And you know, this kingdom that we're invited to build with God, it's going to take a lot longer to come to earth because we're constantly disregarding, disqualifying ourselves from the call. It's the spirit of God that marks us out. It's the Spirit of God that rushed on David that set him apart in this moment. But I just want to I just want to back up this point with a little subpoint. 3B, we'll call it. The Spirit qualifies us, but our choices shape us. The Spirit qualifies us, but our choices will shape us. I want to encourage you today to know that you have access to the same power that raised Christ from the dead. You have access to this spirit of faith that is stronger and wiser and more than we could ever be on our own. But our choices do shape us. Because I think it's important in this moment as we look at this story in 1 Samuel to remember that somebody else was also marked by the Spirit. 
King Saul was marked by the Spirit. King Saul was also fully equipped to go and be the king that Israel needed and deserved. But his choices disqualified him from that leadership line. You know, we just read, Samuel said, he would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But your choices were not in line with what God wants. The Spirit qualifies us. Let's feel confident in that. But then our choices shape us. And it's a partnership. This walking forward in God, it's a beautiful partnership where we get to trust him to be our provision. And then we shape our lives in line with what he wants for us. The spirit qualifies us, but let's not imagine that we don't have any part to play here. We've got to make the right choices. We've got to trust God for the right moves in our lives. Point number four, we are given more when we're faithful with little. I think this is a huge lesson from David's before. We're given more when we're faithful with little. We see David. We see him on the mountainside. We see him faithfully doing a good job. And the more that's about to come to his life is practiced for because he stewards so well the little responsibility that he's been given. You know, the Bible continually uses shepherding as a a, a visual example, a symbol for us of what it is to lead and love people. In shepherding, we see that heart of care for those that are being led. We see compassion. We see sacrifice. We see what it is to lay down our lives in order that our flocks might flourish and thrive. Shepherding is constantly used as this example. And David gets to actually go and learn the skill set that is going to be required for him in leading a kingdom by leading a flock of sheep. It's little. It's so easily overlooked. It doesn't feel important. It doesn't feel grand or in any way exciting. But David's posture is, I'm going to use this time, and I'm going to do what I have in my hands, and I'm going to do it well. I want to learn. I want to grow. And it's in this time on the mountain that I imagine he refined some of those musical skills that were just about to get him noticed. Because what else are you doing? There's no phones to scroll. There's no people to chat to. It's you and some sheep. What else are you doing? But make use of it. You know, he's, he's out there taking his, take, maybe taking his uh, musical instruments out there and just refining this skill, this little that he has in his hands. And that very thing is going to open doors for him in the future. Maybe these are the moments where he learned to write that poetry that we now have in the book of Psalms. Maybe these are the moments that he learned to listen to the Spirit of God and put it down into thoughts and words. Maybe these are the moments that he learned to sing praise as he was out in creation. I know that the before is frustrating, but it has opportunities that are unique and important. And maybe if we do well with the little that's in our hands now, God is going to know that we are trustworthy with the much to come. There's a parable in the New Testament in the Gospels about the talents. And we see this same principle echoed right the way through the Bible, where God gives to someone And those who are faithful receive more, and those who squander what they have, have it taken away. The same is true way back in the Old Testament here. God has given David some small opportunities and some small responsibilities, and look what he does with them. He grows, and he listens, and he develops himself. But this is what happens next in 1 Samuel 16. It says, Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul. The king gone before the one who wasted his opportunity. And an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Another message for another time. Saul's attendants said to him, See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who could play the liar. He'll play when the evil spirit from God comes on you and you're going to feel better. So Saul said to his attendants, Find someone who plays well and bring him to me. And one of the servants answered, I've seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the liar. He's a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well, and he's not too shabby. This is what we need to know, though. The Lord is with him. The Lord is with him. David, I don't know how how's David got spotted out there on the hillside watching the sheep. I don't know. But because he's faithfully done what was in his hands to do, and because he's done it well, he's starting to get a reputation among the people who matter. You're doing something small right now, perhaps. Perhaps the things in your life feel small, but if you can hold them well and ask God to grow those gifts in you, then perhaps they're going to open doors. Perhaps they're going to take you to the places where you need to be. You guys in this room who are musicians, 
This is the day to practice, to pour yourself out. Are there songs in you that you can start writing now? Don't wait to be asked. Don't wait for the opportunity. Start it now. Get used to exercising that gift. If you're a writer, I believe there are books to come out of this generation, books that we need, books that we have to hear in order to see God's kingdom come. Start it. Start it now. What are we waiting for? We're so often waiting to be recognized or invited. But David models to us a lifestyle of using what he has on the hillside and knowing that when you're faithful in the field, God will put you in the palaces. If you can be faithful on the hillside, if you can be faithful in the fields, God will get you to where you need to go. You don't need to push your way there, but God will get you to where you need to go. The Spirit of God is with him because I see him just holding godly things and holding them really well. But this takes us to our final point. Uh, and that is this. It's better to be out in the pasture with God than in the palace without him. It is much better to be where God has put you if it doesn't feel important, if it doesn't feel like the final goal, it doesn't feel like what the dreams are made of. It's much better to be where God has put you than to be in the place that looks right and be without him. And we see that with David and Saul, don't we? Saul is in the palace without God. David is in the pasture with God. I know where I would want to be. I really know where I'd want to be. And we've got to be so careful how we measure our lives. Because what you might think of as insignificant, God might be seeing as that pasture time where he's developing something in you. He's honing something in you. He's turning your attention and helping you focus on the things that are going to matter for the rest of your life. Showing you the leadership within you, beginning to cultivate the lessons of how you would wish to be treated and how, therefore, you'll treat others when the responsibility comes. It is much better to be out in the pasture with God. And I just want to encourage each one of us, if these feel like the before days, if it feels like something is coming and it's not quite here yet, if you are with God, you're in exactly the right place. You don't need to move. You don't need to push. You don't need to fight your way into where you think you should be. You're in exactly the right place. And sometimes it's going to feel uncomfortable. Sometimes you're going to have this sense of, should I be somewhere else? Is there something else for me? But we have to remember where God has asked us to be. You know, I was reflecting on this message, and I was just thinking about when we first moved to America. And honestly, in those first, okay, the first three months were like a holiday, like a vacation. But after that, I experienced like a really uncomfortable homesickness. And I just realized that, oh, I've, I've moved from everything that I know, from everyone that has, to this point, really been my people, my family. Uh, we're shifting. We've shifted. And then COVID hit. And I just experienced this kind of intense, like, I don't know. I don't know if I can do this. I feel like I need to run. I need to get back to what is comfortable, get back to where I know. And I would say to Josh often, just tell me how long. Just tell me how long we're going to be here for. Are we here for one year? Are we here for three years? Are we here for five years? Are we here for 10 years? I can get my head around it as long as I know how long I need to do that for. And I think we often like that. We often behave in that way. God, tell me how long I'm working this job that I hate. Tell me how long I'm in the single life. Tell me how long until my prayers get answered. How long until my bank account looks like I want it to. If you tell me how long, I can hold on. I can persevere. But God... God kept saying to me, and Josh kept saying to me, <laughs> thanks, um, you, you gotta, we haven't been called anywhere else. God's called us here, so this is where we need to be. We're here with God. Better to be here with God than somewhere more comfortable without him. And I want to express to you, you know, we're not without God. Let me just clarify, we wouldn't be without God. But we can be in the center of his will, or we can be dancing around the edges. And it depends. It depends whether we're looking for our preparation or our preference. And I was all about preference in that moment. I'd rather be where my, where my family is. I'd rather be where I understand. I'd rather be. But God said, no, I'm preparing you for something, and you need to be right where you are right now. And so we've got to trust that God is going to take us to the right place at the right time. But it is better to be in the pasture with him than to be in the palace without him. This is what scripture says. Saul sent messages to Jesse and said, send me your son, David, who is with the sheep. They knew exactly where David was because he hadn't moved from the spot that God had put him. He had not tried to get into the palace. You've got to remember that he's anointed at this point. He's already been anointed and marked out in the presence of his brothers. The prophet has poured oil on his head and said, you are the one that God has chosen. He already knows where he's going, but he doesn't have to take himself there. 
He stays where God placed him in the pastures, in the fields. He continues to be faithful. And when the time comes, the king knows where he is. Saul said, go and get your son David who is with the sheep. So Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine and a young goat, and he sent them with his son David to Saul. David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul liked him very much and David became one of his armor bearers. And then Saul sent word to Jesse saying, allow David to remain in my service for I am pleased with him. This is where the second level of preparation comes in and we'll talk about that another time on another week. But this is where David begins to learn the ways of the palace. He as a future king gets to first of all be a servant and an armor bearer in the palace. He gets to learn who does what, how do people speak here? How do I conduct myself? How else is a shepherd gonna sit in a throne. He's got to learn. And so God moves him to his next phase of preparation, but he knows where to find him because David continues to stand where he's planted until he's called forward. And I think sometimes this is something that we have to handle as well, right? When we're in our preparation season, maybe you know what God has ahead of you. Maybe you know what he's calling you to, and there's a rush and a push and a desire to get back to that place, to get forward to that place, so that you can establish yourself there. But God says, stay where I put you and I will move you when I need to. And we gotta be remembering this. But ultimately, I wanna just sum it up all like this. We're all being prepared for purpose. There is great and significant purpose on your lives. And if you've never heard that before, uh, God has sent a little British woman to North Carolina (laughs) to say there is purpose on you, there is something significant for you to do because this kingdom has to come. This heaven has to come to earth. It's been prophesied. It's been promised that he's going to use you and me to do it. There is something for each one of us to do, but we're being prepared for purpose. You know, your purpose requires preparation. And I think we'd like to skip that preparation. We would love to see the miracles without needing to have faith for them. We'd love to see the breakthrough without needing to see the wall. We would love to be able to receive all that's promised to us without having to go through any of the capacity stretching that God requires us to go through. But here we see David, a man after God's own heart, who is humble in the face of being overlooked, who is faithful with the little, and who stays where God puts him until he's called out of it. And I think we have so much to learn from this. Our purpose, the great, exciting things that are on all of our lives, is going to require preparation. But how will we walk that preparation? Will we walk it like David? Will we walk it like one who trusts that God is about to do something big and significant in our lives? Will we walk it like those who are submitted to his timing and his plan? Because we're all being prepared for something incredible. And I would love for us to just take a moment and reflect on that right now. Whatever you're before, whatever the thing is that you feel like you're in the before season of, God's getting something ready in you. He can use this time in you. He can use it in order to get you ready for where he's taking you. And we just need to have that same posture as David. So I'm going to invite you to close your eyes in the room right now. We're going to pray. And I think that as we reflect on this message, there's something for all of us just to take a moment in and ask God, what is the condition of my heart? Am I considering these days as days hidden from you or days fully in your sight? Am I trusting your spirit to mark me out? Am I faithful with what's in my hands? Am I in the place you've called me to be in? Because I know that God wants us to be actively aware of where we're going, but that doesn't mean we rush ahead from where we are right now. And I know that he's calling so many of us to be those who use this time to multiply, to grow, to develop in preparation for where we're heading. I'm gonna pray for us and then I wanna invite just a group of us in this room to consider a, a particular response to God today. And that is the response of surrendering your life to him for the first time. I believe that there are some of us who maybe have never really fully grasped hold of the purpose that's on our lives. And the way we grasp hold of that purpose is we surrender everything to him. We make him Lord of our lives. We ask him to come in and lead us. And I'm going to pray a prayer right now that you can repeat in your heart. You can repeat out loud. But if you recognize that you're not one 
who is walking with Jesus in the way that maybe I'm talking about, the way that you're hearing about this morning, a way that is fully surrendered and trusting of what he has for us, I want to invite you to consider today as the day that you can start that relationship. So let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and you rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust you and follow you as my Lord and Savior.